afternoon. Today we're going to be demonstrating female catheterization on a female mannequin. Um, quick disclaimer, some of the products that will be used um, within this video may not be products that you're familiar with. However, we will try and go over all the products and list some product um, references in the description box. Um, so if you want to check out what products that we've actually used for this video, you may look down in the description box and you'll find the relevant products there. We are going to be covering um, a female anatomy and we're going to be working with a part dummy. Um, so in case you're anxious about whether we're actually using a real life person, no we're not. We're just going to be using a female model um, to help with urinary catheterization. Again, maybe what I will say at this point in time is that um, female catheterization is usually not as straightforward on a real human being in the fact that um, female anatomy is different so you would need to look closely to be able to identify the relevant aspects of the anatomy that you need relevant to your patient um, i know typically on the mannequin you will clearly see the evidence of three distinct holes representing the meatus the vagina and the rectum um, they are clearly identified on the mannequin but maybe not as clear um, within the actual human being that you will be assessing so do try and sort of think about maybe how you can have a look and adapt um, what you're learning from this video um, specific to the clinical setting and the patient that you will be working with. Right, in terms of the products that we'll be using for today, um, you've got your independent catheterization set that comes in handy with your irrigation sets. You would still need to prepare the catheter itself, the leg bag, the straps, the um, sterile fluid for inflating the balloon. Um, as well as any lubricant that you might need for that. You've got the Bard Catheter Care Set, size 12 Chariot. This is a latex um, product. I do understand that if a patient had latex allergy, you'd opt for a silicone option of a product. However, just to state that this comes fully intact with all your lubricant, sterile water for the balloon, as well as your cleansing wipes, etc. So um, we'll look further into that once I've opened that pack. Some OptiFlow for flushing in case you have a patient with a lot of sediment or debris within their urine and you're thinking about giving them a general flush to improve the quality of urine that you're getting from their catheter. A clamp that will help us prepare for any collection of urinary samples that we might require from the patient. Some alcohol wipes just to make sure we've adequately decontaminated the region of collection. If we do need to collect a sample, however, we've come into contact with the key part. And last but not least, um, a syringe for the actual collection of our urine. So that covers the general products that I will be using today in, a con uh, in conjunction with our gloves and alcohol wipes. Obviously, if you have access to soap and water in a sink, then you'd be using that instead of alcohol gel. And um, just to remember that you need to be mindful to change through your gloves as is required. So first and foremost, establish that it's safe to approach. Um, key points to think about when you're getting ready for catheterization is to make sure that your patient has taken a shower in that day. Uh, if they're a female patient, obviously you'd advise them to wear a dress because it does make it a little bit easier um, to perform the procedure um, without them needing to take off any trousers. However, again, it is subject to the patient and what they're more comfortable um, actually doing. Um, obviously, if you have access to soap and water, you would be using that. In this case, I'm going to prepare my hand gel and just decontaminate my hands. As is appropriate, my kit ready. I've consented my patient and she's happy to have the procedure done. In terms of opening my equipment with the bar tray, it's got a lovely obvious arrow which you can look to so that you can just pull away and open your equipment. First things first is I'm going to open my kit, just taking care to pay particular attention to just hold the ends of my drape. Apron on top, which I'm going to go about the process of putting on at this point in time. And then I'm going to go about the process of draping my patient. So I've got my initial patient drape, which allows me to actually protect the patient's linen. Now it's got a filmy side and a dry absorption side. 
Ideally, you need to have the filmy side connecting with the patient's linen and then the absorbent side facing upwards. At this point, I would request that my patient um, lifts the bottom so that I can put my drape underneath. Next, to maintain my privacy and dignity, I'm going to apply my secondary drape that only allows me to expose the area that I will be working in. At this point in time, it will be interesting to just have a closer look at the different pieces of equipment that you're likely to come across on or in the bar tray. Okay, taking my first set of sterile gloves. I quite like these gloves because they have a clearly identifying marker that signals as to where the thumb actually is, which makes it easier when it actually comes to putting on your gloves. my next set of gloves for when I need it and then within the tray I have quite a few things that you might want to take a look at. I've got my sterile water for cleansing, I've got a spare syringe, I've got some assorted gauze here and I've got my lubricant and my sterile water for the balloon. Right, now some people may ask, what's your preferred technique for doing this? I like to put on my straps before I actually start the catheterization process. Uh, and this allows me to also have minimal contact with my actual key part. Now you may choose to put on your straps after the fact. But from an efficiency perspective, I find that this works best. Keeping or making sure that I'm not coming into any contact with the key parts and making sure that my catheter is adequately threaded, protecting any key parts. I'm just going to ensure that I insert my straps and then move on. Right, so my device is now ready to go. Um, the next thing I'm going to focus on is actually my cleaning technique and making sure that I've adequately cleansed the labia um, in preparation for the actual catheterization process. So, assuming that my patient has taken the time to actually clean the outer side, I'm going to focus on my inner labia minoria. Coming first to the right side, so going through from one side, top to bottom, keeping the labia parted and discarding. Moving to the left side, top to bottom, keeping the labia parted and discarding. At this point in time, I'm just going to add a little bit of gel just to make this more comfortable for my patient or lubricant. And you don't need too much, just about a mil. And then additional gel for the actual catheter insertion. Right, next step, whilst I wait for my lubricant to actually take effect, I'm going to remove my first pet of sterile glass. Okay, taking care to prep my next set of gloves. Right, getting my catheter ready. And as you can see on the catheter, you can identify the crisscross dotted lines, either going to the top or going to the side. Now, some people prefer to remove the straps at this point. I find it easier to actually remove um, the straps at the top because that gives you better control 
um, as the clinician managing or inserting that catheter. Now you don't want to expose too much because that means that you're likely to come into contact with that key part. So I'm going to expose as little as possible so that on the initial end, um, I'm not exposing my key part to too much contact. Right, informing the patient to take a deep breath, uh, as well as the fact that I will now be inserting their catheter, I will part the labia again and begin to insert my device. Now, some people prefer to use the one-handed technique as I'm doing to gently thread the device through. Another person might actually sort of think in terms of threading and holding, threading and holding. I find it easier to minimize my contact with my actual key part. So I can now see urine in my device. So I can stop. This point in time, it's gonna remove the rest of that plastic. and then inflate my balloon. Now, typically, I would get rid of my air bubble first. And I'm going to inflate my balloon to about a size eight, because sometimes I find a size 10 might be quite big and likely to irritate the bladder neck. However, there's no problem if you choose to insert up to 10, etc. Sometimes you do get balloons that shrink because the concentration and density of urine is higher than clear water, so you get water moving from the balloon uh, into actual urine, which might minimize the amount I get back when I remove that device. However, currently, I've made sure that I've inserted my balloon, and then I'm just checking to see that that is nice and secure, which it is, and then I'm just going to remove the protective covering alongside the catheter. If you follow the dotted line, it kind of makes it easier to remove. If I needed to collect a urine sample, I'd obviously need my sample bottle. And I'm also going to need a clamp. So the idea is not to collect the sample from the urine within the bag, but to collect the sample that is flowing through the catheter directly from the bladder. So I would clamp just before the bag. Now, if this catheter had been on the patient a couple of days before, etc., then I would get an alcohol wipe and decontaminate the area first before collecting that sample. And all you're doing is cleaning that for 30 seconds and then collecting your sample after. That's provided you've actually come into contact with the key part and that end is already contaminated. You only need about 10 mils for your urine sample. Then you're going to label it appropriately with the patient's surname, name, date of birth, etc. And all the relevant details that need to go in there. Um, and I would know that this is a catheter specimen, um, the date and the time that the specimen has been collected. Um, and then send it off to pathology. Having collected my sample, I would then remember to release my clamp because I don't want my patient... Um, to have a blocked catheter because I've left the clamp in situ. Next thing I'm going to think about is securing that device so that it's safe and easy for the patient to mobilize or move around. Just going to remove that. Now, sometimes people have applied lotions to their body or cream to their body, which makes that skin very slippery and slidey. So you might just need to cleanse that with a little alcohol wipe first prior to positioning your secure grip so that it attaches securely on the actual skin. leaving that to dry for 30 seconds. Then now I'm going to attach my secure grip. Just 
just being mindful not to attach it on the inner side of the thigh because if somebody had slightly larger thighs then that would rub against each other and cause trauma or damage to the other thigh placing that gently and attaching my clamp and then I would attach my straps as is appropriate making sure there's enough lag room there so that that doesn't stretch or pull too much on the balloon causing it to come out mm. if I needed to flush my device because I observed that the urine was particularly cloudy and we needed to give the patient a flush and basically we would start off with a saline flush if the amount of sediment was not excessive however if you've got excessive sediment um, you could look at the different OptiFlow products that they have they've got the one that's actually for slightly stronger sediment more debris um, quite a lot of um, bits in the urine so you could always look to see which one is indicated for your patient mine is only slightly concentrated with minimum debris but i feel my patient needs a flush at this point in time so i'm just going to remove that remove the clamp release my secure grip Placing the catheter bag on the floor again. Clamping at the top because I don't want it to leak. Removing my leg bag. Making sure to minimize my contact with key parts. Inserting my flush. And just using that pulsatile action gently, moving my clamp and introducing the contents of the flush. So that I get the full 15 mils in and then just let it gently flow back into the bottle. So ideally, what you put in, you need to see come out. So once I get back my 50 mils, which I believe I've achieved now, I'm happy that's an adequate flush, and hopefully I should start to see less sediment with this. I will clamp the top again. Remove. And reconnect. And that's how I would flush the catheter if I needed to flush or give the patient a flush to clear any debris or sediment. We've now reached the moment um, in which our catheter now needs to come off. So I've prepared my catheter removal pa pack and then I'm going to commence informing my patient that I will be removing their catheter today. So whether it's a catheter insertion or a catheter removal, you still need to make sure you gain consent for both procedures so that the patient is happy um, for you to undertake those procedures. So we'll now be commencing a removal of catheter. Right. Can I do Making sure I've adequately decontaminated my hand. And then opening my removal pack. Now the process of removal will follow a septic non-touch technique. It's no longer sterile. A septic non-touch technique. And what I can quickly identify within the bag, first and foremost, is my apron. So I'm going to pop that on, move on to the next element of my kit, which is my waist bag. Just sorting through, trying to make sure that I've got my gloves in the correct order. And within that pack, you will also find a little bit of gauze. Okay. 
sure I place that in between me and my patient. And now I can come hand in my hands one more time. And then I'm going to get my gloves on. Making sure I have loosened or removed any secure grips. If this was difficult to remove, I would use an alcohol wipe just to help facilitate removal um, because these tend to stick really well on human skin. However, as this is a dummy, it tends to peel off quite easily without any problems. Next step or first step would be to deflate the balloon. Inserting the needle or syringe into the device itself and just letting any volume flow back. You don't really need to pull back because that would automatically um, push the plunger back as it's flowing. Removing that, carefully noting how much fluid I'm getting rid of for my balloon. So I've got about six mils in my balloon, which I will take note of so that I can document that on any relevant patient documentation. At this point in time, I would ask the patient to take a deep breath as I gently pulled out my catheter. Now note, if my catheter seem to be a little bit stuck I might want to irrigate a little bit with some saline to loosen that however as it's not been there for a long time it shouldn't be too problematic to pull I would then ask my patient to take a big deep breath as I gently pulled out the catheter using a singular motion being careful to note any sediment on the catheter tip or any incrustation on the catheter tip. If there was anything that I was particularly worried about, I would cut that off and put that in a sample bottle and send it off to pathology. I would also want to conduct an inspection of the labia to make sure that there was no unnecessary trauma caused to the patient um, and just to make sure that I had not necessarily left the patient contaminated with anything um, that they might need to wash off a little bit later. And that looks perfectly done. Any urine that I would be emptying, I would record. So obviously you would empty that in a urine bag, record the amount of urine that you're getting out of the catheter, and then I can dispose of the remnants in clinical waste. <music>